after, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, book that I've written that will be coming out this year. And it's called The Mid Valor Hope and Fish Breath. And in that book, I start off talking about sea turtles, and uh, which I won't talk about during this presentation, but they could be included for sure in the whole poaching equation. Those uh, sea turtles, you know, are victims of poaching, just like many other animals. Um, however, when I was about seven years old, we, uh, my family and I went to uh, some islands off the coast of Africa called the Canary Islands. And, um, and my dad would always kind of take us to the most fancy restaurants, you know. And, um, and I liked to impress my parents at a young age because I was a little precocious, which is a word that means I was kind of a jerk. And uh, so I would always order, hi Kelly, <laughs> I would always order the most expensive thing on the menu. I'm not giving my presentation right now. I'm just kind of pre-talking a little bit. Um, and so I, without looking at what it was, I looked down the menu and I ordered the most expensive item and the waiter brought it and it turned out to be turtle soup, it was sea turtle soup. And, uh, and I'll never forget that because, because I didn't realize, like I said, I was seven years old. I didn't realize the importance of that. But, uh, but almost every sea turtle in the world now is endangered, and most of them are now uh, critically endangered. And, uh, and you kind of take that for granted when you're younger. So during the presentation, I'll tell you about a different turtle story, but I wanted to share that little pre-story with you guys. Hi, Kim. Everybody doing okay? It snowed here today, which I know, Kelly, you've been having snow, but... It went away for us, and then it snowed today. So this morning, the whole place was just socked in with snow. I can actually, well, you can't really see it behind me, but it's out there. Yeah, yeah. I get to go from snow and freezing weather here, um, and then uh, in four days, I'll be in uh, equatorial Africa, where it's 99 degrees. So, awesome. So I'm going to get started uh, shortly. I know we have a few other people that are going to be uh, joining us. So I'm going to give them a chance to, to come and jo join in here. I'm going to scroll down real quick and see who's all here so far. So is everybody doing okay today? Everybody having a good day? Yes. Okay, so we have somebody new. Hello, new person. I am doing pretty good. I am uh, I'm on the upswing after having had a pretty rotten cold the past two days. Um, and, and like I said, I mean, this, it's just bad timing. <laughs> uh, I got that cold and I was looking at the calendar thinking, man, I'm a week out from going to Africa. It really bummed me out to have jet lag and a cold at the same time, so I'm kind of glad I'm getting over it, but I'm doing good. So, Deb, are you back yet? I, and I shall start. Okay. You can tell I'm getting serious because I'm sitting up straight. Um, hi, I'm Rick Wood, and uh, this presentation, Exhausted Bounty, is actually uh, 
it, it's a very difficult subject, so I'm going to try to break it down into pieces that are easier to digest. Um, we, we're talking about wildlife poaching, and uh, we play, of course, an integral part in the solution of that. And uh, but let's let's back up a bit. First of all, let me introduce myself. I was. Um, and I have been many different things. I've been a school teacher, I, I, I'm a combat veteran, uh, I'm a writer, I was a journalist for many years, but I was also a uh, animal control and rescue officer here in Washington State, um, which we'll talk about a little bit because um, some of the cases that I worked on kind of crossed paths with uh, what can be considered poaching and wildlife uh, crimes. And then, uh, and then since that time, uh, after being a journalist and, and working in uh, newspapers, I actually went on to become a filmmaker. And I made films about sea turtles, I made films about manatees. Uh, the, the one film that got the most notoriety is called Fragile Honor. It's a film about southern resident orcas and Chinook salmon. And it was after Fragile Waters that I was invited to uh, do a lot of guest speaking and I got to meet some incredible people. Um, you can see Dr. Jane Goodall on the uh, screen here. Uh, met her last year about this time. And uh, she and I had a wonderful conversation about sea otters. And last year for the National Biodiversity Teaching, I actually did a presentation on sea otters. Um, so, you know, it was, it was just incredible to have that, that moment with her. And throughout my entire life, I've always been driven to do something that either helps animals or people. And I believed in animal conservation and talking about critically endangered animals is actually something that marries up two concepts. So you get to help not only animals, but if you do it right, you help people as well. And um, we're going to dive right into the poaching part of this because it's, it's a lot to talk about. So this might seem a little funny to look at. Um, there's a statue, and this is from England. And this is a statue of a character that we pretty much all come to know as Robin Hood. Um, and that's a, that's a legend. But it's based on a few possibly true people that, um, that inspired that legend. And even though movies and stories from today have painted the uh, legend of Robin Hood to kind of be about stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, the, um, the only thing that we know that's historically accurate is Robin Hood was a poacher. And when I say poacher, I need to define that. You see, poaching isn't, uh, isn't just the killing of African elephants for their tusks for ivory, and it isn't uh, illegally shooting an animal for, for meat. Poaching can be a lot of different things. And I'm going to start by telling you a story about me uh when i was about eight or nine years old and when i became an accidental poacher but it has a happy ending so i'm gonna throw it out there first so i, I and i said this before the presentation started i was a precocious child and precocious is a word that basically means kind of a jerk um no i'm kidding but for me it was true and what <laughs> what I would do from time to time was kind of see what I could get away with, you know, just uh, test the boundaries, push the limits, get in trouble. Um, everything from melting my Star Wars figures to the hood of the car to, and don't do that, by the way, that's, that's not good, um, to what I'm about to tell you. And so my dad used to take us out in nature a lot. We used to go walking. Uh, hiking and we would go um, and I grew up in, in Germany until I was about 10 and we would go through the forest and and you know you come across these beautiful uh, scenic ponds and lakes and um, and there was one day it was the summertime it was nice and warm and we came across this little pond and there was a little turtle about well, maybe about so big a little pond turtle and he was sitting on a rock and I went over to get a closer look, and he didn't move. So I thought it was actually dead at first. And I was curious, so I went and I picked it up, and then, of course, the legs came out, and I was like, whoa, dude, put me down. 
And I thought, well, he he's obviously is not afraid of me. And of course it's a he because when you're a little boy, every animal that, that you come to is a he. And um and so I put it in my pocket. <laughs> I put it in my pocket and I brought it home. And uh and my brother, who's five years older than me, so I'm gonna lay the blame on him uh, on him. And this is as it should be, because that's actually why you have an older brother. Um, he should have known better. I was eight or nine, and he, he was, you know, going into his teens. You guys know that he should have been responsible. And um, he went and he found a little aquarium, a little glass bowl, and we got some rocks and we put it in there and we poured some water in it and we put this turtle in there and we got some grass from outside. And we threw some grass in there, and that was pretty much all we knew about taking care of this turtle. And the first couple of days, that wasn't that much of a problem. And believe it or not, my parents had no clue. They had no clue that a turtle was there. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then it started to stink a bit, because that's what happens when you don't take care of a turtle. Is they smell bad and have like a little fuzz of algae on it, and it just wasn't good. And, of course, my mom found out, and, you know, this was a little bit of a problem because we lived in a high-rise apartment. So, uh, my mom basically said I had to go put it back where I found it, and uh, and we did. We went back out to the forest, and I let it go into the pond. And my dad explained to me that when you take wildlife without permission, if you hunt without permission, you go fishing without permission, you steal somebody's cattle, you do uh, anything that harms wildlife without permission, that's called poaching. So when we look at Robin Hood, we're looking at poaching. And that became a legend that kind of became heroic because at the time, and let me explain why Robin Hood would have been a heroic figure. At the time, very few people owned land, and those that owned land were exceedingly wealthy. And for the common people, a deer that was on a wealthy person's land was illegal to hunt. Even if you yourself lived and worked on that land, you couldn't hunt it. That belonged to the owner of the land. It didn't, own, it didn't belong to you. So Robin Hood going and poaching the... Uh, the wildlife in uh, Sherwood Forest or wherever, Nottingham Shire, or uh, not, not Nottingham Shire, but, you know, where the sheriff of Nottingham was, um, this, this was looked upon by the common person as being heroic because he was taking something that should have belonged to everybody. And that's debatably okay on a subsistence level. And when we talk, of, of talk about subsistence, we're talking about taking something that you that you intend to utilize to survive. So if you're starving and you take a fish or you take a deer, um, you're feeding your family, so you're staying alive. And it didn't have it didn't have a very nefarious connotation. It wasn't like an evil thing per se. But over time, poaching integrated into something else. And uh, so the image that you see now on the screen are two otter pelts. It's a mother and a baby otter. And this was not illegal when this picture was taken. It's illegal today. But what happened is the fur industry took off, and in the United States specifically, it caused a uh, such a rush of people to come and hunt uh, sea otters for their pelts that uh that it drove them to near extinction and in fact in california the southern sea otter was actually thought to be extinct so much so that it, it's in textbooks from the early 1900s that otters or the sea otters were extinct in california and uh and this was very sad because people were confused a little bit at the same time you had an animal called the uh, American Buffalo, it's a bison, that, uh, that had been hunted to extinction. You had, the, uh, you had the, the passenger pigeon, which had also been hunted to extinction. And all of these, these animals were uh, thought to be endless bounties. 
That is to say their numbers were so great in the 16, 17 hundreds that it was inconceivable that you could kill enough for them not to survive. And, and a great example of this is uh, if you live or have visited the West Coast of the United States, if I were to ask you about animals that live out in the ocean, if I were to say, you know, name a couple of whales or uh, marine mammals that live out in the ocean, and, you know, you could come back with all these different things, and I were to sit there and go, okay, but what about manatees? A lot of people would just give me a blank stare. But let's say this was 1800 or 1700s, and I were to talk about manatees off the coast of California and Washington State and Oregon, um, everybody would nod their head and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were huge. They actually existed. They were, they were eventually called stellar sea cows, and uh, they could be up to 20 feet long. These, these things dwarfed the uh, Florida manatees that are still around. And they were in such numbers that, uh, that again, they were endless bounties. They were thought of to be inexhaustible. There was no way you could kill them all. And they were kind of kind of easy. <laughs> they stayed near the surface, and they were fairly slow moving. So for people that were uh, really skilled at, at using a harpoon and whaling, um, stellar sea cows were no challenge. A lot of animals were like this picture actually comes from the uh, archives of the Alaskan uh, State National Archives. And uh, these are seals. These are actually fur seals. They're northern fur seals. And, um, and the ones that you see, if you're looking at the picture, the ones that are on the left-hand side have already been killed. The ones at the right-hand side are about to be taken. And they're not running away because they had such a limited experience of dealing with human beings that it didn't enter their flight or fight response um, to try to get away from the human beings. So human beings literally just clubbed them to death right there in mass numbers. So that's historically when we talk about poaching, that's what we're looking at, is we're looking at the, the illegal take. And of course, this picture is not even illegal. This is when, uh, when killing seals um, was an industry, much like sea otters. And, of course, when those numbers declined and came down to nearly nothing, um, they stopped. Laws were put in place to protect these animals. And, uh, and that's, see, that's the difficulty of poaching. And that's where poaching becomes a global issue. But we'll get into that a little bit more later. This... Uh, to kind of paraphrase it, though, it sucked for animals who had no contact previously with human beings. Um, you, you've heard about the dodo. You know, and, and a lot of animals that were sheltered from uh, human hunting uh, through millions of years of their existence and evolution had no reason to fear people when they came in contact with them, so they were very easy prey. And... Um, I want to talk to you something about something more specific and and uh, something that I can give you an eyewitness account of. Um, more than a year ago, I became a volunteer uh, marine mammal stranding uh, response person, and the Marine Mammal Stranding Network here in Washington State is a network of volunteer organizations that cover the coastal areas of the entire state of Washington. And there's a stranding network in Oregon that covers the coastal areas of Oregon and so on in California. And so I joined the one here locally because I actually live, I live about a mile away from a harbor. And we have a colony of harbor seals. We have about 150 uh, endemic harbor seals here in uh, Blaine, Washington. And so I thought, you know, and, and this actually genesis from having done the presentation that I did last year on uh, on sea otters, and I thought about it. I thought, you know, excuse me, I have a cold. <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm talking about starting at home, and I do things like reducing my plastic consumption. Plastic is a pretty nasty substance, especially when it ends up in the environment. 
and I talk about these things that, that I can do locally, but I also had time. And the thing about having time was that I could go out and do things um, very uh, with very little notice. And as a stranding responder, you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to go, okay, uh, there's a call about a stranded harbor seal, and I need to go out within the next 10 minutes and, and check on this animal. For the most part, and that's a picture I took on my cell phone, uh, the baby harbor seals during pupping season, uh, they weren't actually stranded. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a lot of calls about that. And see, and that's kind of one of those weird things where you love it that people care enough to call. And at the same time, people have this uh, misinformation. Uh, they think that when they see a little harbor seal pup, oh, I've got this one. When they see a little harbor seal pup sitting alone somewhere and, you know, just kind of hanging out, they think that it's abandoned. And they think that its mom isn't going to come back for it. And so we actually had to go out and do what's called seal sitting. Now, this wasn't a rescue. We would do, out of, uh, out of dozens of calls, we would do a handful of rescues, and I'll talk about that later. But, uh, but most of the time, seal sitting was actually sitting in a close but not exceptionally close proximity to the animal and, uh, and kind of guarding it, guarding it from people... Uh, people that want to take selfies, you know, people that, that want to harm them, people that might want to pet them, like me. No, I never pet them. It, it, it's a necessity. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, also, it's also not a necessity. If people would just ignore a baby harbor seal that's uh, sitting on a dock, chances are its mom will come right back for it. Or within a couple of hours after she's done eating, she'll come back for it because it has to, uh, they're mammals, it has to nurse, she has to feed to uh, be able to produce milk. And so that's what happens is she deposits the baby on the dock and she goes away. And so people see this little fuzzy football sitting on a dock and crying out, I kid you not, this is actually what they sound like. Mm. They sound like they're calling for their mom, and they are, but it doesn't mean that they've been abandoned. <laughs> and so what ends up happening is uh, people want to help it, and that can lead to tragedy, and, um, and that's inadvertent poaching, when people try to collect them. And so you will hear stories throughout the pupping season of people who collect them in, uh, you know, garbage bags or whatever, and then take them home. And they put them in their bathtubs, and they try to take care of them. And, of course, the, the, the end result of that is that the harbor seal pump dies. It's also a criminal act on both the federal and state level, um, so people can get in a lot of trouble. And uh, so that's inadvertent poaching. And harbor seal pups are, are a huge target for that because they look so cute. They're also a huge target for something else. This is me uh, towards the end of last summer working on one of a handful of suspected poaching cases. That's a harbor seal pup. What you see in the picture, um, I'm moving its, its flipper out of the way and pulling it towards the, the camera. Its head has been crushed in. And um, and not from blunt force trauma. There was a hole there. And um, and we would go to the summer. Um, our network and the network next to us would have about four calls about harbor seal pups and they've been found killed. And uh, and so our job at that point, of course, isn't rescue. It's to uh, collect them and collect the evidence to uh, to send up the federal chain and document what happened and uh and if the federal uh, organizations decide to do an investigation you know they can uh they can try to prosecute it's a difficult thing though 
when I'm working a case like this, when I go out on a poaching case, um, I'm not angry. I'm not sad. I have to go into a very, in the moment, I have to go into a very concentrated focus. And that concentrated focus is purely scientific. Because what I want to know is, I want to build the most scientific case possible for what actually happened. And uh, and so in this instance, the picture that you're looking at, I could not conclusively say that the harvest seal pup had been shot. I can tell you after the fact that there was a lot of things that that made me believe that it had been shot. Um, the tide was coming in. And what you can't see is off to the right of this picture. I'd come down an embankment and a cliff, a small cliff. And pretty soon the tide was going to... Uh, take this harvest hill pup out into the water, which it did. And we weren't able to uh, conduct a necropsy. We weren't able to do a uh, autopsy on an animal. It's called a necropsy. And we weren't able to do that investigative process on it. Um, so the only thing I was able to do was take photographs and measurements and GPS data and that sort of thing. Um, but all indications, if we'd been able to do the necropsy, we probably would have been able to make a determination that it had been shot. Um, having been in the military, and I'd served in combat years ago, uh, one of my one of my sets of training was on uh, on weapons, and having that that skill set, just looking at it, I could tell that it was a small caliber hole, and it looked like it entered the the uh, the cranium cap itself, it looked like it was shot from above. So it was somebody who saw a seal pup in this position and shot it here. And that happens for a variety of reasons. And it would be it would be easy to just write it off to sick people having their sick humor or trying to have uh, fun by killing an animal, but that's actually not why they do it. And we're going to get into why they do it. This is a one-day-old harbor seal pup. And they're defenseless. They're absolutely defenseless. Um, when people poach these animals here in Washington State, they do not skin them. That is to say that they don't take their pelts so you can cross it off the list of, of reasons why this happens. Um, they do not eat them. So you can cross that off the list of why this happens. So why would someone want to kill an animal that looks as cute as that? And, uh, and the answer is complicated. But it's also, in its root, it's very simple. Um, People are mad at that animal because they love this animal. This is not a real one, but this is a Chinook salmon. And Chinook salmon are endangered salmon here in Washington State. And the thing about Chinook salmon is they're right now at 10% of their historical numbers. That is to say we've depleted their numbers by 90% of what they were when people started measuring their population. And these guys are worth a lot of money. Chinook salmon are expensive. If you buy uh, salmon meat, it's it's very expensive to get. It's also called king salmon. Uh, king salmon, Chinook salmon, very expensive. Um, most protections afforded to any salmon are afforded to king salmon. And that's fishery protections. So let's talk about this. So we started with pinnipeds. And when I talk about pinnipeds, I'm talking about seals and sea lions and walruses. When I talk about sea otters, I'm talking about a different animal. I'm talking about the guys that you see there. Or this guy. Sea otters are endangered species. A lot of marine mammals you're going to find out are endangered species. Uh, but sea otters were almost hunted to extinction. I told you at the very beginning. Uh, but sea otters were almost hunted to extinction. I told you at the very beginning of the presentation. And that was for their pelts. 
And then all these federal protections were put in place when they found a small population in California. And that population, that population actually grew from about 50 otters in the 1920s to about 3,500 otters today, the southern sea otters. Their numbers have come back very, very nicely, very incredibly. Uh, but not everybody's happy about it because sea otters, as you can see by the little shells on the on the one tummy in the picture of the, of the juvenile sea otter, uh, sea otters eat bivalves. They eat things like clams. They eat uh, they eat more than that, but they also eat uh, abalone. Abalone. Remember, I was talking about Chinook salmon being worth a lot of money. Yeah, abalone is worth per pound a lot of money. And that's kind of weird, and we're going to talk about, and this will all connect here in a second, because one of the most poached animals in the United States is the one you would think the least about. But sea otters are not hunted now for their pelts, and sea otters are not hunted for their meat. Again, people shoot them because they think they're in competition with them for abalone and for other bivalves, other uh, clams and, and that sort of thing. And uh, while I was working on, on uh, my two most recent films, one actually on sea otters, and then the film about the southern resident orcas, I was down in the Monterey Bay area. And while we were there, two, two sea otters were, uh, were shot illegally and killed. A year later, one was shot. And then last year, two more were shot and killed. Um, so within the past three years, there have been five poached from this tiny population of about 150 to 200 sea otters. That's a very significant number. If you think about that in percentages, you know, you're talking about 2.5% of an entire local ecosystem worth of sea otters removed just from poaching. And these are endangered species. So this is a California sea lion. This is also from the Monterey Bay area. It didn't die from poaching. It died from starvation, but they are also shot and killed because a lot of uh, a lot of people blame them for the loss of certain fish populations. In California, they're the scapegoat for sardines and uh, herring and, and things like that. Um, in Oregon and Washington, they get blamed for the extinction of this. Sea otters are, they have two natural predators. Um, great white sharks are number one, and uh, orcas would also be on that list. Uh, orca wouldn't typically go after a sea otter because they are literally just a big fur ball. Um, sea otters do not have blubber in their, in their body. Uh, like other marine mammals, they are uh, fur and meat. And um, and so, you know, most most of the time when they're killed by predators like a great white or an orca, it's a it's a chomp and spit out like a hairball. I mean, bleh. And, um, but great whites right now account for the highest mortality rate of sea otters. Um, so that's their natural predators. Um, and then there's human. And not just poaching, but I'm going to throw one other thing out there. I, I had a uh, star of my film, Deconstructing Eden. Uh, his name was Mr. Enchilada. He lived near a restaurant in the Moss Landing area. And, um, and he was killed because the city came in and they covered the culverts, put screens on the culverts between one wetland and another for whatever reason, I couldn't tell you. And it caused this old otter that everybody knew and everybody adored who stayed in this one little area of the marina to have to cross the street. And uh, he was crossing the street one day. And when they cross, when they when they move, they're really awkward, right? He, um, he got hit by a car and he was killed. So uh, human impact on sea otters is not fully measured. Uh, in California, I would I would estimate about five percent of all sea otter deaths are human related, and then uh, the rest are disease and predator, natural predator related. 
So let's get back to salmon real quick. Scapegoating a uh, an animal for eating prey that it's eaten for a couple million years seems a little silly to me. And I actually talk about that um, because because I think we need to have this discussion more before people decide to get angry at sea otters and harbor seals and poach them. I think we need to understand that the number one threat to salmon is human beings, either through how we take them out of the wild by fishing legally and illegally, or because we restrict their ability to spawn through dams. And underneath that comes their natural predators like sea lions and seals. And um, and calling them, that is to say, I'm sorry, my cold is killing me, C-U-L-L-I-N-G, calling them because they eat salmon is like uh, shooting a person because they eat hamburgers. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I was going to continue to talk about the starvation part of it. Um, there's a reason why there's pinnipeds moving into waters where they never lived before. And that's because there's another factor that works into poaching, and that's climate change. As our, our climate changes, the sea changes. And as the oceans change, both their acidification, their temperature, their salinity, uh, currents are changing, the fish are moving places. See, where there were sardines and herring in huge numbers in California, they've now moved up. And actually, there's a lot of herring. There are record amounts of herring in the, in the uh, areas around Alaska and Vancouver Island. And, um, and it's causing mass starvation in California, which is what you see on this slide. It's a sea lion from uh, San Francisco. And... Uh, it's a yearling, so it survived for almost an entire year, but I just couldn't find enough food. And you can see how thin it is. Sea otters eat bivalves. They eat abalone, they eat clams, they do all these things, but they also are a keystone species. I talked about this last year uh, for the presentation that I gave. Keystone species means that they provide a such an important benefit to the ecosystem that without them, if you remove them from an ecosystem, the the ecosystem begins to collapse. It degrades itself. And um, and that's why we need to protect them. And I just want to reiterate that because because I'm going to talk about poaching now as a global problem. The number one poached animal in the world is shellfish. And you don't think about that. I didn't think. Of that. I actually didn't think about that at all until I started working on on my uh, on the last book that I wrote, which is coming out this year. And it's a called. It's. I'm, I'm going to do something special at the end of this presentation. I'm actually going to unveil the cover for my new book um, to you guys ex exclusively. Nobody's seen this yet except my publisher. And. Um, and it was in the course of writing that book that I that I really started to, to get a sense of of the depth of uh, how much poaching takes place among clams and abalone and shellfish worldwide. And here's here's the bottom line: I can't give you a statistic. I can't give you a number. Here in the U.S. alone, it's estimated that for every uh, legally taken, every licensed and legally taken shellfish. There are two to three illegal shellfish animals taken, and you gotta you gotta look at that picture for a second. The picture that's on the screen, the slide that's on the screen. You're looking at individual animals, and when you think about it in, the, in those terms, and you think, well, and this is a low estimate because, like I said, nobody has nobody has the actual numbers, but we know for sure that a million bivalves are poached every week, a million, around the entire United States, on the, all the coastlines of the United States. And that's, that's a million individual animals. Now multiply that in a global sense. Maybe there are some places where there aren't as many protections or laws. Maybe there are some places that have better whatever. But on average, you multiply a million per week 
times, let's say, 200 countries. Subtract the countries that are landlocked completely. And, heck, let's just have that number and call it 100. It's 100 million per week. It's a lot of animals being poached. Poaching takes place every day. Poaching actually takes place, like I said, inadvertently and for purpose. And in the United States, inadvertent poaching means that sometimes you catch the wrong fish. Sometimes you don't have a fishing license. Maybe you throw out a crab pot, and in the crab pot, there's more crab than you're supposed to have. But nobody's around, so you go ahead and have the crabs that are illegally caught. Um, poaching also includes plants. A lot of people don't, don't know that. It's become a big industry. Uh, the, the illegal take of certain plants is growing because there are people that will pay huge amounts for certain types of herbs and, uh, and plant species. So poaching is a, is a global problem for sure. And, and that's, that's kind of important because um, I think as people were coming into this presentation, I mentioned that uh, I'm headed to Africa. Um, I'm actually leaving three days from tomorrow and I'll be in Africa for about a month in Tanzania, which is in East Africa. And this is where, and I'm going to flip through my notes to get to this. This is where things get easier to see because they're so critical. Um, Tanzania is the, the battleground for illegal poaching of the big five. That is to say, the, the animals that we, that we think are, are the... Um, when you think of Africa, you think of things like lions and, and rhinos and elephants. And these are animals that are going extinct, specifically due to poaching. Elephants are a big one. Um, let's break that down. In the past nine years, 144,000 elephants have died from poaching. and uh, I've been giving this presentation for about 40 minutes. Uh, roughly uh, in, the, in the amount of time that I've been talking to you, three elephants have been poached today. An elephant gets poached every 17 minutes in Africa. Their numbers have dropped so precipitously that it is estimated, unless something incredibly drastic happens, the African elephant will be extinct from the earth in the wild in the next 30 years. We are losing 27,000 of them per year. 27,000 elephants. That's not what you're looking at on the screen, by the by. What you see on this slide comes from an organization that I'm actually going to Tanzania to spend time with. These are the folks that go and rescue orphan elephants and rhinoceros and giraffe that were uh, that were orphaned from the poaching trade. And you might go, well, what's the big deal? Why are people poaching elephants? Well, they're not eating them. And um, and, and it's, it's not very complicated. It's their tusk. When, uh, when we talk about rhinos, let me talk about the black rhino real quick. You talk about rhinos, you're talking about less than 5,000 black rhinos left in the world. Less than 5,000. And most of them are in the Tanzania and Kenya area. So I'll be seeing some of those out in the wild too. I'm actually going on patrol with the anti-poaching unit um, to go see the, the front lines for myself. And, um, and the rhino horn is different than the elephant tusk because elephant tusks are made of a substance that we've called ivory. Uh, rhino's horn is made of the same substance as your fingernails. And it really is just fingernail material. But if you got a pound of rhino horn in your hand, and you had a pound of platinum in your hand, the rhino horn would be worth a lot more. Pound for pound, rhino horn is worth more than platinum or gold. 
and that's why poaching, just in the numbers that it does. When uh, when poachers are caught in these countries, so you talk about Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, um, these are not people that have money. They don't even make big money off of these elephant tusks. The people that sell the elephant tusks to the people that are going to take it to Asia, which is the primary market for ivory and rhino horn, they, they, they pay the poachers $100, maybe, to go and do this. But here's the point. <laughs> the average annual income for a family in Tanzania is $1,700 a year. So for somebody who's on the brink of starvation and dirt poor, to make $100 every couple of days, it's worth the risk. And here's what they risk. Poachers in Tanzania are, can be shot on sight. Uh, there's a war going on between poachers and anti-poaching units. It's a shooting war. And it's as brutal and, and as bloody as uh, a human versus human conflict. And it centers on these animals here like, like this orphan elephant. This elephant that you see in the slide did not make it. The odds are way, way, way stacked against orphan elephants. They are a social animal. They're a lot like whales in, their, in that regard. They need their mothers. They need their herd. Um, if they don't have that social connection, they give up. And uh, here's what's interesting. I told you I was in a war, right? I suffer from something that's called post-traumatic stress disorder. That is to say, I saw things and was involved with things in combat that uh, that caused me emotional stress that has that has affected my life. Um, they did studies on these these orphan elephants and rhinos, and it turns out that orphan elephants develop PTSD. They develop post-traumatic stress disorder. They live with it for the rest of their lives, and um, and so the, the loss in her mother doesn't end the sorrow for them. It's that point to which you need to breathe. We all need to breathe. I know I do. Because I get heart sick about this. This is a difficult thing. And you might think you're insulated from it because you live in the United States. But you're not. You're going to experience these things. Um, poaching happens every day around you. And there are things you can do about it. You have a voice, and this is what's important. A lot of people think that they're helpless, but you're never helpless if you can still have a voice, if you're still able to do something, to say something about something. Uh, I, I know it, it sounds weird, but the only tip that I'm going to give you on this, this is so very important, is if you see something or you hear something about people illegally fishing or hunting, I ask you to say something. This is not a time in our history where we can ignore these things anymore. If you don't think it's that critical, Chinook salmon has been barred from recreational fishing in Washington State in many places. And as those numbers continue to dwindle, It'll become less and less available to recreational anglers, to fishermen, legal, legal fishermen. Uh, that's going to happen for almost every species of salmon as they slide into extinction. And their numbers are going to dwindle if we keep taking the amount that we do. And that fact that I threw at you, the fact that there's 10% of the historic numbers of Chinook salmon alive today, as there were back in 1900, is uh, that should make everybody stop a moment and take a look at it and think, hey, you know, maybe there is something I can do. Make personal choices. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm, I'm saying you always have that option to have a voice. You always have that option to speak out. When you know something's wrong, say it's wrong. Have courage. Fear isn't courage. Fear is not Courage is saying something in spite of fear. This is in my book, and I'm about to show you the cover for the book. 
I say eventually you come to the point where being immobilized with fear is replaced by a need to do something about it. That's me speaking. That's what happened. That's how I got to where I am now. That's how I got to writing about and being a journalist covering conservation issues, making movies about endangered species, going to Africa to examine these issues. And I'm deaf, by the way. For those of you that didn't see me last year, um, I'm deaf as a turnip. I, I don't hear. And I still go out and I do these things. This trip to a Africa, I'm, a, I'm a, it's a solo trip. I don't have an interpreter. I don't have an assistant. It's just me, a deaf guy, going 10,000 miles away and uh, walking around hoping that I don't get shot by poachers or eaten by hippos. Um, the fear doesn't, doesn't drive you. What ends up driving you is the fact that you have to reconcile with your conscience. So you get to a point where you realize that you need to do something about it. I want to share with you the cover. My publisher is the one that said, hey, maybe you should show them. Maybe you should unveil it during the biodiversity teaching. So this is very exciting for me. This is the first time that anyone has uh, publicly had a chance to see my new book, which is actually coming out. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but it will be uh, later this year, probably around the early fall. And it's called A Mid-Valor Hope and Fish Breath, Lessons Learned from Endangered Species. Uh, I'm immensely proud of this. It uh, It's not just a good story because it's about me. <laughs> I'm not that big of a narcissist. It's about the animals that are in there and how I learned from them. And I learned a lot. And, uh, and we're hoping that uh, that I'll get a chance to talk to you guys about that uh, maybe next year for biodiversity teaching. And, uh, and that's, you know, and that's the key. It's just keep learning. The world is is always in motion. Hey, Valerie. Um, Valerie's statement is true, and I want I want to read this because I'm not sure everybody's reading this. Uh, Valerie Stein is, is one of the publishers of this book. She said, I'm proud of this, too. It's a testament to the hard work of many people to save species. And that's what it is. It's not about, it's not a, it, it's not Rick's story about looking at animals. It's really about the amazing people uh, that go out there and do do just this wonderfully heartbreaking work to save species and uh, save animals out there. I'd like to open up to any questions because I know we're going to run out of time soon. Um, and and it, could be, it could be questions about the species I've talked about or it could be questions about poaching. And, uh, and I'm here for, for your questions. Anybody? <laughs> I do want to, before I forget, thank you guys for joining me in this conversation. It's really important to me to have the ability to talk about these things because if these subjects aren't talked about, um, obviously nobody would know about them. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Whitney. I appreciate that. Thank you, Elgin High School. What am I most excited about for my trip? Um, I'd have to say that there's two parts to that because I want to tell you a little bit about, about my Africa trip here, so bear with me. Um, on one part of it, I'm going to, to, to take a first-hand look at the poaching issues, and then I'm going to look at the people that are helping. So I'm spending days um, out actually into the, the uh, Serengeti and I'm going to spend time around wild rhino and wild elephants but I'm going to be with uh, rangers that conduct anti-poaching patrols and then um, and then part of my time is with a group called the Kilimanjaro Animal Crew and they are a fantastic organization that goes in and takes in the orphan elephants and rhinoceros and twiga uh, a giraffe and they, they uh, nurse them back to health, and they try to reintroduce them back to the wild. And, um, and they do this mostly through heart, because there isn't a lot of money to 
do these these uh, these things. They're just amazing people. So there's going to be that, and then I'm spending about two days uh, staying with the Maasai tribe with Maasai people out in the bush in their village. Not a tourist village. These are the uh, these are just working folks, and I'll, I I really want to learn more about our connections as human beings to each other. And I want to learn about the connections about human beings to animals. And as the animals are more and more affected by poaching and climate change, humans are more affected by poaching and climate change as well. We're all in this together, so you know, that's that's what I'm most excited about. I'm spending time with orphans, human orphans. Um, I'm also going to be spending time with, with the widows from the AIDS epidemic, uh, which is a very huge problem. Any other questions? You know, I'm going to try to post as much as possible. I do have a blog. If you, uh, Oh man, I need to send along the the link to the website and the blog. Uh, if if Deb can uh, can help me put that link out there, that would be awesome. Oh, you're welcome. But you know, I I don't. I would love to say that I do this stuff because I just have such a profound interest in animals. But uh, but I have two kids. I have a a son and a daughter, and I, I can't imagine uh, can't imagine them growing up. And being adults in a world that doesn't have elephants, that doesn't have uh, orca, southern resident orca, so uh, so that's why I do what I do. But thank you for, thank you guys for listening to me. I appreciate it greatly. You're welcome, Miss Kelly, and thank you for everything you've done to help facilitate this. Yo Oceans is amazing. I, I, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. And of course, I got a plug. We'll go one, one back here. I'll plug my book again.